You know I've raved about Outer before, and I love my Outer sofa, outdoor dining table, and chairs. I've had them for over a year, and let me tell you, they've been through everything from rainstorms to scorching sun and still look brand new. That's because Outer makes outdoor furniture that's actually designed for the outdoors. From using incredibly durable and sustainable materials to developing innovative solutions like the Outer Shell Cover, which protects my sofa and dining table against dust, debris, and dirt. No more soggy cushions or dusty tabletops. My outer setup is always clean, dry, and ready to be enjoyed anytime I want. Head to liveouter.com slash thefounderhour to see Outer's range of outdoor furniture, fire pits, and accessories. The Founder Hour listeners get an exclusive 10% off for a limited time. Terms and conditions apply. So elevate your outdoor space with Outer. That's liveouter.com slash thefounderhour. Hey everyone, before we get into the episode, just a quick reminder, if you enjoy what you hear, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. That way you get notified when new episodes drop. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, at The Founder Hour. Let's get into it. Brian Smith, welcome to The Founder Hour. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. It's great to be here. Wonderful to have you. Uh, So let's take it back to your early days. Talk to us a little bit about your childhood and where you grew up and what you liked to do as a kid. Sure. I had a great uh, childhood. I grew up in a city called Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. And luckily, my dad had a house at the coast about 100 miles away. So I grew up with a beach, you know, upbringing and a small city upbringing and uh, wasn't really great academically. I was more into fun, Mm -hmm. sports and stuff like that. And in my 20s, I uh, got into accounting. You know, my dad was really insistent on a good career and a solid career. And, you know, and uh, What did your parents do? Uh, my da- dad was a uh, construction, you know, civil engineer, had a construction company. And um, I uh, went into that not willingly, but because you know, of the pressure. Mm-hmm. And uh, it took 10 years for me to graduate. Because I was studying at night and working in the daytime, and uh, the day I graduated, I quit. What what kept you going for so long? I mean, ten years college, like I would have given up by year like five. Yeah, well, I was I was living in Sydney at the time, and I was surfing with all my buddies, all, you know, and, and work was just to pay the bills. So yeah. I wasn't I wasn't looking at it as a career. But I hate giving up on things. The mm. Perseverance seems to have been one of my big traits, you know. Yeah. And so I, I stuck it out. I moved to Perth during that time, for, and I lived in Perth for 10 years, and uh, that, that was a fabulous city. You know, we were sailing and playing. I played really high-class rugby at that time, and life was good, had lots of friends. You know, everybody knew me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it got to the point where, you know, when I quit being an accountant, it was like, oh, shit, what am I going to do, you know? And uh, I was pretty lazy about thinking what to do and, and one afternoon i was driving down the, the canning highway on, on my way home and i heard this music on the radio and i didn't go home i went straight to the record store and bought dark side of the moon mm-hmm. you know, by pink floyd great record because yeah. and i started playing that and and um you know the next day i was listening to the words of this song time and it says tired of lying in the sunshine staying home to watch the rain you are young and life is long and there is time to kill today. And I went, oh, shit. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. Yeah, that was the next verse. <laughs> and I missed the starting gun. I thought, oh, shit. You know, all my friends were tracking off to partnerships in accounting and other friends who started businesses out of high school. They were, they were all doing great. And I'd been running on the spot for 10 years. So. Did, I mean, how old were you at the time? That- I was uh, 28, 29. Yeah, and I mean, up to that point, you would never thought to yourself, you know, I should probably have a career. No, <laughs> no, I just, I was just, you know, having fun. Yeah. Really Talk to us about fun. the impact that surfing had on your life. Oh, it was really tremendous. It, it's, uh, it's, for me, it's almost spiritual. Not, not every surf is spiritual, but there are days when I can get out in the water and, and it's just absolutely um, calming. It's, it's, it doesn't matter what worries you have in your life, you get out in a good surf and, you think of nothing else. And I, I have to tell you, my favorite surf, I never even caught a wave. Mm. I, I just paddled out one evening and it was really small surf, you know, one to two feet. And 
but I was watching the sun setting and the the you know the sparkling of the w- waves in the water and, and was crimson golden and you know I just sat out there and I was just talking to God for like an hour and then I finally just paddled in because it got too dark you know yeah. it was it was really that's yeah surfing's very very you, you talk deep. a lot about that in the book in your book and and like this connect with the universe um, yeah. growing up were you like religious or in you know into spirituality a lot or? um I. <sighs> I quit Sunday school because, you know, the pastor asked, told me, you know, have your mum and dad come along next week. And so the next week, you know, mum says, well, tell him we're sick, you know. <laughs> and, and so that was the end of my religion. <laughs> I, I, at five years old, six years old, I realized that this is hypocritical, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, but I used to debate God a lot, you know. I had a bunch of surf buddies. We, we'd go down to the coast on Friday nights and, We'd all end up in someone's garage, you know, sleeping, and and we, we you know, we would debate God until everybody started throwing shoes at us, and uh, so I was always interested in it, but not really spiritual. But what is what would you? How would you describe this connect with the universe? Because you do, it sounds like attribute a lot of these yeah. like key moments in your life to this, yeah, di- divine thing. Yeah. Well, as I've got older, you know, back then I had no clue, but as I've got older and been through just you know situations that just demanded some sort of faith or hope um i came to realize that that that, you know and and this is for me personally that 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 i believe there's some spark of fragment of god in every single one of us you know god's not out there at the end of the universe and uh it it is an actual fragment of the pure spirit of, of god if you want to call it that and uh it has a mission for what it wants us to do and I've I sort of got to this understanding or this thinking because of the amount of times I had goosebumps and and realized shit that was really meaningful mm-hmm. you know and and I started to figure out that maybe that's my spirit trying to you know say hey way to go Brian you're on the right track but it can't talk to me because I well, I I can't listen and so it comes through this electrochemical system and and, and it comes out as goosebumps and. And when I started speaking about this on stage, I, I started asking questions. You know, raise your hands if you've got goosebumps. And like everyone does. And after the talks, I was pretty scared to talk about that in, in the first time I did it. And I got so much positive feedback. Oh, my God, thank you, Brian. You know, I really connect with that idea of you know, God being in me because I've, I've got those feelings too. And so I've just come to realize that everybody does. Yeah, every every t- every person I talk to has that same reaction. So Brian, you're on this Canyon Drive. You stop by the record store. You pick up the album. You hear these words, and yeah, what, what I, do you do? Well, the next, you know, after that, I, that shocked me. Number one, like shit, Brian. You, can, you know, you got to do something. And it was the next couple of days. You know, I I'd, I'd bought a book on yoga back then. You know, it was way before classes or anything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, it had led me to meditation just by holding these poses. I was breathing really, really heavily, and that got me high. And that sort of was what meditation was. And and I started thinking, well, what am I going to do? And I, and I just like I got the goosebumps at this time because I, I thought, oh my god, all the big trends are coming out of California. And I thought, I got to get to California, you know. What, what, what got you to thinking that? Just, you know, I'd seen Waterbeds and Levi Jeans and, and all the surf brands and the skate brands. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I, I don't know what to do here in Australia, but if I can go to America and find the next big thing and bring it back, that's, I can make my, my living doing that. You Had know? you make, seen make, anyone do that in your kind of area or neighborhood um yeah there were people who had imported different things that 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 were all doing pretty well in their businesses Mm -hmm. and uh so literally within a couple of weeks i i arrived at lax and you had my surfboard and my suitcase and i rented a little house in santa monica and rented a dodge van and it was just you you're just me and i knew one other person in in america at that time you talk about this coming to you, you know, sort of in a meditation, meditative state. And, you know, oftentimes I feel like it's not completely serendipitous. Like they're in your head, in your psyche, like you're probably, you know, your thoughts sort of manifest this and bring this to you in, when you're sort of in that state. And I'm just, I want to talk about your mindset at the time, you know, being 28 and having this like unfulfilling career and wanting something different and more. And, right. you know, how 
how much was it eating at you? Like, was it something that every day you were just like, I need to figure this out? I, yes, yeah. but by then the need to have some sort of direction in my life was getting stronger. Yeah, I definitely had that urge to be more responsible, for want of a better <laughs> word. Um, but I had no idea, you know, I, I just knew I didn't like accounting and there was none, none of the other things I was seeing my friends do was interesting. And so... I, I I sort of liked the spirit of adventure uh, to just pack up and and go. Uh, Did anyone tell you not to do that? Oh, my parents were so against it. Yeah. Oh, Brian, you're giving your life away. You know, you got a steady career. And, you know, their, their their vision was for me to be, you know, head accountant and then you know work my way up to the CFO. And you know, all I could think was this: like going to prison. You know, and. Uh, even though my dad had his own contracting company and he i think maybe he was protecting me from being right. an entrepreneur because because right. it was so damn hard for him and, and our family even though we did great i i remember how the, how hard it was you know mm -hmm. but i didn't even think of that it, to me it was adventure what it, what got you to say you know what i hear you guys but i'm still i'm still leaving um i just just left <laughs> <laughs> there, there wasn't any consensus <laughs> Um, in fact, when, they, when, you know, uh, my dad finally saw that I was, you know, three or four years, you know, into trying to build this business of importing Ugg boots, uh, he started to see that, oh, I, I, now I know what Brian was doing. Right. You know, I see a, I see a, 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 a potential growth here. Yeah. 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 When you first moved to America, you had a pretty life changing event that happened with your house. Um, tell us a little bit about what your experience was like yeah, to come to this new country. Was, that was weird. Like I, I knew I didn't want to live in a big apartment building with underground parking, so I got this little house in Venice. And, and you know, I was so new, I had no idea of the, that it was a black street, you know, if, um, and uh, there were bars on every window in the street and there were big high fences. I had no idea. That, that should have been warning signs, right? But I had no idea. And so I rented this one little tiny one-bedroom house there, and it had a little sunken bedroom. So I, I just bought a water bed, and I put that in the in the lower section, and sat down. The very first night I was in there, and I had I bought a big candle about you know fifteen inches tall, and I lit it and stuck it up on the shelf on the on the wall, and uh, you know listened to music, and just eventually went to bed. And the next morning, I. I sort of woke up sat up in my bed and everything went black and i went shit and i went down again and I, and I realized you know there was about a six to nine inch sort of gap of air uh on the floor and, and i realized oh my god the house is on fire you know and this is like your first week or so first night first night oh, yeah first yeah night i didn't even my... unpack my suitcase that oh, all burned Jesus. up you know um, That's a warm welcome. Yeah, <laughs> and and I crawled all the way to the through the living room to the front door, and, and I, you know, was reaching up, and I, you know, I think I panicked because I couldn't get it open, and uh, I knew the back door was out. Of, that was where most of the fire was. I couldn't go out there, and all the windows had you know, bars on them. So, so I. I, when I reached up and I and I couldn't open the door, I just sort of collapsed on the floor and went, "Oh shit, I'm going to die." And then this weird, no, this voice. It wasn't a weird voice. It was a. It was weird that I heard a voice, and it was really, really calm. And it just said, "You haven't done enough with your life yet, Brian." And I just went, "Shit, you're right." And I just had this surge of energy, and I. I went down, grabbed another breath of air from the floor, and then I stood up and I started walk, work my way down the walls, and I started smashing out all the windows with my fists. And uh, and luckily, the sunken bedroom had a couple of feet more air, so I got back down in there and I I would take a breath and I'd scream out the window. And, and there was a workman a couple of houses down came up with a crowbar and got the bars off and pulled me out. And you know, the house was you know the, by the time the fire trucks got there, it was finished. And uh, that was another sort of thing in, my, in the back of my mind which made me think, hey, there's something in me that is not me, right? There's, right. there's, a, there's a presence in, in this, this life. Talk to us about that voice. Is that something that you've been able to tune into 
many times throughout your career? I've tried, by God, I've tried. <laughs> Putting yourself in scenarios where like, come on, voice, where, yeah, are you, where are you? I, you know, I always hold myself open when I have a meditation, but uh, um, there are times when I've, you know, become very still and, and, and I've sensed the direction, never, never the, that voice, never the voice. Um, and uh, there, there was one time uh, that I was contemplating a business venture to go into with a friend and and this voice said just it, it it wasn't again it wasn't the voice but it was a very direct thought that wasn't my thought which said get out of it brian that's all it said just get out of it brian and the next day i got talked into it and i went into this deal and it was a disaster it, it cost me uh, you know mm -hmm. everything i owned you know 10 10 years down the road mm -hmm. so so, uh, yeah, the, the voice is there. You just got to to listen to it. Right. So, Brian, back to that moment. So, you're luckily you escape your freed, saved, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, you have no place to live now. You have one person that you know. You're in a city that you're not familiar with, perhaps. Um, I mean, is it just anxiety all the time, or are you rather no, like. No, it was, that was adventurous, you know. Um, I immediately just ended up renting a house. You know, I bought that, I rented that house because it was cheap. And then I said, forget cheap. So, so I rented a house up on Wilshire, Wilshire Boulevard and, and it was uh, three bedrooms. And so I decided I'll get, get roommates. So mm -hmm. I rented it and then got a, a roommate and uh, a couple of roommates. And that, boy, I lived there for a year and a half, two years, really happily. Yeah, and this was just money that you had saved back from Australia. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd had a, a house that I'd, you know, my parents had helped me buy years previously, so I'd, I'd sold that. So yeah. I, I had the capital to do it. Nice. Not much, but I had enough, yeah, enough, enough to live on, yeah. yeah. At some point, um, you see this ad in like a surfer magazine about sheepskin boots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, was that, yeah, how did that come to well, you? Well, for, for like... Three or four months, I'd been literally looking for a business to take back to Australia because I had no intention of staying. Do you remember some of the other ones that you maybe came across at that uh, time? No, I'd look at you know the Wall Street Journal, or I'd look at billboards, and I'd look for new products or you know services, and there was nothing that it really grabbed me. And uh, and it was you know one day I, I was looking at the you know Mag Surfer magazine, and there, there was an ad for for sheepskin boots. And uh, and I just got the goosebumps again because in I knew one in two Australians had some sort of sheepskin footwear, and I extrapolated shit. You know, America's population is tw you know tw ten times the size of Australia, two hundred million, and we got like twenty million down there. Uh, oh my god, I should stay and do it the other way. And and so I I. Uh, you know, I was with a buddy of mine, Doug, and, and we decided, you know, I said to him, hey, man, we've got to go into business. We're going to be instant millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you think that, it, you know, Americans would want it? Like, what did you? Well, America is so much like Australia, and mm -hmm. California especially is identical to, to Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just figured if, if they were that popular in Australia that it's going to be an instant, you know, hit. And uh, so, you know, we, we did, Doug and I did a little research and we, we ended up calling a guy in Western Australia, um, George Bircher, who, who was uh, a little manufacturer of, of you know, there were, there were 50 to 100 manufacturers yeah. in Australia. And this is country leather? Yeah, this is country leather, George Bircher. And uh, we, we talked him into letting us be his distributor, you know, and so we, we got a couple of hundred bucks together and sent it down and and um, ordered, you know, three pairs of samples. And uh, they finally arrived and, and Doug went on the road uh, to, all the, uh, to all the, you know, the footwear stores in Southern Cal and came back a week later with about 150 business cards and not a single order. And he said, Brian, they, they tell us we're crazy trying to sell sheepskin in California, you know. And you know why, why is that? Just because they were well, unfamiliar with uh, it, or Americans don't understand sheepskin like Australians do. Like we're we're born with this sheepskin knowledge. You, you you know you cannot rip a sheepskin. The strongest guy can't rip a sheepskin. So it's really sturdy, and and you can wear them when they're wet. 
and they still keep your foot warm. And, and they don't smell. They're washable, yeah. And in America, it was like, oh, man, they're so hot. They're so delicate. Sheepskin, you got it. You can't, you yeah. know. And uh, we have mud and we have slush where we live and, oh, they'll never work here. And you know, So there was this c- complete disconnect. It was just a lack of education. Yeah, lack of knowledge of, of yeah. what sheepskin was, right. yeah. Yeah, because Australia, we grew up on you know, right. sheep. And uh, so um, that was the reason we got no orders. And uh, as entrepreneurs, you have to figure out, well, shit, how do I get around or over this problem? And... and I started thinking laterally, which is, you know, like pivoting right. is a proper popular word now. But um, I thought, how come all my buddies up at Malibu think this is the best idea in the world? Because I'd, I'd been surfing Malibu since I got here every every day, you know. And uh, and did you have the, your sheepskin shoes at the time with you? Or well, no? well, it was, you know, late summer. I had, yeah. had I, I, I did have them. I brought them with me to but America, but I didn't, I hadn't worn them. And, uh, uh, all of these uh, friends of mine were going, yeah, I, you know, I was in Australia, I bought half a dozen pairs back for my buddies, you know. So within the surf community, it was really well known. So we, we just pivoted and went off, you know, back to the surf. So it's shop. one of those things that you're surfing, you get out, you're walking on the sand, and you just throw on your yeah, sheepskin shoes. Yeah, like, like you know, late October when the surf got really, you know, chilly and the wind was cold, I, I'd get out of the surf and I'd pull my sheepskin boots on and, and because they breathe, you know, within five minutes, your feet are warm and dry, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was very practical right. for that market, you know. So, you know, we, we started going to the surf shops <laughs> and uh, all the surf shop owners were going, oh, my God, that's a great idea. You're going to make a fortune, you know. We, yeah, we, all my friends have got them, you know. And so we ended up realizing you know when we sort of met up he doug took the san fernando valley i took all the beach stores and we met back and we said oh my god we're going to be just so rich (laughs) everybody thinks this is the best in the world you know and all you're doing is importing these basically yeah 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 and so we called up george and we, we we my roommate overheard us talking about needing money so just like that we got 20 grand which in today's money is about eighty thousand, and uh we sent 15 down to Australia to George and at Country Leather and uh, ordered 500 pairs. And they arrived uh, in late uh, November, early December. And we you know, sorted them all out in the third bedroom in the right. house at Santa Monica. And we went back out on the road now with these huge duffel bags full of boots and order pads. And because we hadn't asked for an order up to this point. And these were mostly for men or women or both? My, it was men was my focus, okay. you know, the surf shop guys, yeah. And, uh, God, I remember going back down to the, you know, the, the same shops that told me that you know, we were going to make a fortune. And it was, oh, well, Brian, you know, we, we, couldn't, you know, we couldn't sell them in our store. We just have um, surfboards and trunks and flip-flops and, and you should go to the shoe stores. You're going to do great, you know. And uh, this happened all the way down the coast, and Doug was the same in the valley. And uh, when we tallied up the sales for the first year of UGG, um, it was 28 pairs. Mm. It was horribly disappointing. <laughs> How did you, what in your mind told you keep going Like at that point? Well, two things. One... Everybody loves them in Australia, okay? So it's not the boots, it's me. That, huh. that was number one. How did, but how did you assess that? Well, the product was the same as they were wearing in right. Australia. So yeah. it, it, it's not the product. But what about you? Like, like the ability to sell them? Uh, well, that was the other, that was a dilemma. It came back to a moral thing on my part. I've got, you know, um, 480 pairs in the third bedroom. <laughs> And all my investors' money tied up, you know. So I really morally couldn't walk away because of my investors. And, you know, I just decided, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, Doug went and got another job because, you know, we couldn't live on it. So so uh, I just started January, February, March uh, trying to sell at swap meets and street fairs and anywhere I could get, you know, a crowd. But the the best outlet i had was the back of my dodge van at malibu in in the parking lot and i i would go up there 
you know, 6.37 in the morning and surf and then get coffee and a donut and I'd go back to the van and I'd open it up and I had all the product in the back of the van. I would just sit there all day. And uh, it was amazing, you know, within a very short time there were, you know, people would be coming up, yeah, I was in Hollywood, I saw a person with these boots and they, they said there's some guy in the parking lot at Malibu, you know. So if you in today's terms, you know, that, that turns out to be what's called a pop-up store now, right? Yeah. right? So, it's and completely it, normal now. Yeah, and that's 50 years ago, you know. So, yeah. And Brian, did this shoe have a name at the, at the time? Yeah, they, they were called Uggs in, in general in Australia. Okay. No, no one had ever trademarked it down there. Is that what the like the the just the common name what was for this? Yeah, type it was of product? descriptive. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where, what, where does that come from? The name? nobody knows. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a few old guys in Australia claim they invented it, but you know, but there's it, like a UGH, right? It was like a uh, different... There's UG, UGH, UGHS. There, there's all sorts of spellings down there. So one of the first things I did when I re- realized I'm, I'm going to go into business was I I employed a, um, a trademark attorney, right? They did a full search of the world and, and America and couldn't find any any prior but use. But that's like over here, I mean, or just anywhere, it's like trademarking a word like couch exactly. for couches. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> well, it, it sort of was, but uh, because there'd been no prior use in the US um, and I could prove I was first, um, that's where you get your trademark rights from. Right. And, and when you're in the back of the van here, what, what is your sales pitch? Um, it was just... People, people at that point who would seek me out, they were going to buy no matter what they saw. So it wasn't really much of a pitch at that time. Right. But as the years went forward, first two or three years, when I tried to make a business of it, the, I, I found a huge deficiency in, in that. And that's probably um, – there are two major things that happened, and, and I'll, I'll just talk about one of them first. That, that summer we sold about – six thousand dollars worth right at, at, at the beach in malibu and then i got a summer job and the next year i i advertised and the sales went to about ten thousand and the another summer job and the next i, I advertised we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later so that that was one of the the things that that um i couldn't figure out what was going wrong i should have been you know selling huge amounts of boots the other thing was as as we were each year developing the surf shop business, they, they would put half a dozen pairs on the shelves, you know, and it was, they were not moving very well. And I remember being in the store after about probably a third or fourth season, and this turned out to be the, the most incredible decision in the history of 20 years of my ownership of UGG, right? And it was so simple. I was... Listening to the customer one day, I, the, I was in a surf shop and this girl came in and she picked up one of the Ugg boots and she holds it up and she f- turns it around in her hands and she said to the manager of the store, hey, you know, what are these like? And she goes, ah, oh, I don't know. And I, she says, well, you know, they feel softer. They, you know, are they, you know, they're expensive. Yeah, they're really expensive. How much were they at the time? They're about eighty nine dollars. You know, yeah. that's a lot of money back then. This is the customer saying the this customers, or the salesperson. The okay, customers, customer. you know, oh, they, you know, and the cut and the, the the manager replied, yeah, they're really expensive. And he said, well, you know, do they get hot? Well, I don't really know, you know. And and I and she put the boot back on the shelf and walked out. And that was like the this aha hit me, you know, from the universe when. God, Brian, you, the, nobody even knows what the product is, right? And so I came up with the most brilliant and most effective marketing thing of, of the 20 years I owned the business. It was called the Six Pair Stocking Plan. And I advertised in the magazine. I got a couple of retailers who were doing okay, and I took their photos and, and put them in this, and, and I advertised, if you buy six pairs for your store, I'll give a free pair to the manager, and I went back again to another store uh, a little bit later on, and you know this this guy was looking at the UGG boots and hey, what are these like? Oh man, they're the best things in the world. I'm wearing them now. He says, well, they're, they're expensive. Yeah, they're expensive, but shit, you oh, they're the best value you'll ever get. And yeah, no, I get them wet. Yeah, wash them, you know, and bam, the sale, right? Yeah. And the, and the managers one after the other just started, and the whole business went to like. 
two hundred thousand dollars. Was was the product back then pretty similar to what it is today? It, it was similar but cruder. Yeah. Cruder. <laughs> did <laughs> it, you, didn't, it didn't have much much panache. Yeah. Did you find that most of the people that were interested in it were surfers and people in the community, or, or were you surprised later to to see that like just people would be wearing them on a day to day basis at home or it, out, outside? It started off really as a as a guy's surfer boot, mm-hmm. and and. You could go out to the beach any morning at you know, six in the morning and see the guys wearing Ugg boots to the beach. Mm. And had you branded it at the time? Like, they were oh yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I got the brand all t- tied up, and uh, so it started off that way. But pretty soon, their girlfriends, you know, started wanting them. <laughs> and that, you know, any guy who bought his girlfriend a pair of Ugg boots was like, you know, the hot commodity, you know. And uh, that went really well, and. Uh, it it just sort of evolved uh, through that to and and keep in mind most of the kids like I'm going to s- divert now to the other sure. the other fork in this story right because I'd been running these ads of these models on the beach at Wind and Sea down in La Jolla and perfect hair and perfect clothing and perfect sunset and that's when the sales went from like. 6,000 to 10,000 and so the next year I got better looking models and you know sales went to 20 grand and it should have been way 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 more you know and uh, so I was about to give up the the whole business uh, and and I wanted to just quit the inventory I had and and so I I was talking to a surf shop owner in, in San Diego and uh I was talking about this advertising, and he, he just goes, oh, shut up, Brian, and he calls out to these 12, 13-year-old grommets in the, you know, in the back of the store, and he said, hey, you guys, what, what do you think of Uggs? And every one of them just walked out and went, oh, my God, those Uggs, man, they're so fake. Have you seen those ads, those models? They can't surf. And, like, instantly I realized uh, I'm sending the wrong message to my target market. Mm. And when I saw my ads through their eyes, I was horrified at how fake these, these posed models were on the beach. And, you know, and, and the, the, the photos, you know, the Ugg boots were the main focus of the whole photo, right? I'd run those ads two years. And uh, so... I switched gears and I called up a buddy who was running a scholastic surf team in Orange County. And uh, I said, Pete, do you have any young kids who are going to go pro soon? You know? And he gave me these two names, Mike Parsons and Ted Robinson. And I, I just went surfing with them at Black's Beach in La Jolla and at Trestles in San Clemente. Mm-hmm. And these are iconic surf walks. They're, it's a mile to get to the water. Yeah. And there's fantastic surf when you get there. And, and uh, I, I just had a feeling that any little kid who was reading Surfer magazine would, would die to be walking mm. to the surf with these kids, you know, these, these young pros, right? And so I, I, and I just did my own, I took a Canon Sure Shot, you know, and that, that's how I photographed them. And when I ran those ads in the Surfer magazine that, that season, the sales went to $220,000. Like, and why? Because it was, I connected with my target market. Wow. So you, know? you think a lot of it just came down to the, yeah. the advertising. Yeah, and, and, and the interesting thing is you could hardly even see the Ugg boots in the photographs. They were so, the boots right. were so small as a part of the overall photograph. And it was more about the lifestyle. It, yeah, it was totally about that. And that, that made me realize, you, you know, you never advertise your product. You advertise the features and the benefits and the more emotion. you How it makes you feel. Yeah, and, and I... I knew that every little kid in America would want to be there. And so that backtracks to the sales is like, who's buying them? Well, the kids don't have any money. They're in high school, you know. Mom, I want a pair of Uggs for Christmas. All the cool kids at school have got a pair of, you know. So mom has to go buy them and she sees them and goes, oh, my God, these are pretty nice. I might get some for my daughter. Mm, so, right. so it was a sort of a splinter effect that, that got it into the female market. I never advertised to them. And I went from, you know, from the surfing market to snowboarding, which was just taking off at that time. And that really worked well with all the young snowboarders. And then... And this is what, the 80s, 90s? Uh, mid-80s, yeah. 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 And, uh, and then for years, I, I wasn't getting any business back east. And then I finally figured out by talking to a sporting goods owner, you know, store owner, um, 
you know, what are the kids doing in the winter? He goes, oh, they play hockey. And, I, and, you know, coming from Australia, I had never, I had no clue what hockey was, right? And, uh, and I did some research and that shit, that market was bigger than surfing and snowboarding combined, right. you know? Yeah, because then you have Canada and yeah. Norway and all these and other so, yeah. so I started advertising in this youth hockey magazine called Let's Play Hockey in Minneapolis. And we did the Hockey Mum of the Week competition, you know, where mm. the kids would nominate their moms. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and and that just, that one really blew it open. You, you know what's interesting? Uh, you know, you talk about all these different magazines and obviously advertising in the 80s, 90s, even early 2000s was very different than advertising is today. Oh, wow, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I remember when Pat and I were growing up, you know, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, those magazines that would come like, on a monthly or whatever bi-weekly basis i mean like you know you subscribe to magazines that you had an affinity to and i mean you read it cover to cover mm-hmm. you know now i'll get a magazine i'm like okay it looks cool like i like watches pat and i like watches oh the front cover looks cool yeah so, okay whatever right we're not really because we can have access to every single thing on social media on i used to online. love those cologne ads that you can oh, yeah, like you rip it up you try it up yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> those are so great but you know it's like you know I, I think that these magazines you really had a captive audience yes and that- today even though it's quote-unquote easier to advertise online you're competing with everybody because yeah. the, the the messaging number or sorry the, the audience is so broad yes and people have so many interests and so quickly can be disinterested in something. that's right so you know I would love to talk about that, you know, later on, but it seems as though the the direct target marketing is something that truly changed your business. Yes, and and even though the medium has changed today, yeah, the the principles of marketing have not changed, right? Right, because if you can't engage your cust- your potential customer on online in like seconds with the right image and and hit them right You're where they. You, they're gone, yeah. right? It's, so it's it's almost more difficult today. Yeah, to to that's to, what I was saying. It's yeah, so, it seems more difficult today. Yeah, it's it's easier because you just put something on your own website and it's right. out there. Right. But but if you don't connect, um, it. it's wasted. Yeah. yeah. One of the toughest things for any product business early on, especially, is managing inventory, like knowing how much to order if you're you know from your manufacturer or from you know your uh, yeah we're your partners uh and then also like how when to you know continue to reorder and, and how much to keep in stock and all that until obviously sales gets to a point where you can predict it a little bit and so I, you know you mentioned early on having to raise some money yep. the twenty thousand, and i think eventually a hundred thousand and both of those times from what i understand you you had to sort of give away half of the business yeah that um, was a I want to talk about that because that's <laughs> that's like ripping open wounds. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, I apologize for putting you in that position, but I think it's super important for those listening. I, I, you know, I just I'm curious going back, like if you would have done anything differently. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah for sure. Um, and I joke about ripping open wounds. It, it's a lesson every entrepreneur ha- in the products industry has to learn. And it's brutal. And my biggest weakness was that even though I was an accountant, I had no idea about finance. And finance is forward-looking and predict, predicting what money you're going to need, whereas my knowledge was accounting, which is, okay, really? I, can, I can tell you what happened last year, mm. right? And so from an accountant's mindset, I was saying, okay, we sold a million dollars worth this year. I'm broke. What's the answer? Oh, easy. I'll sell $2 million worth next year, right? Yeah. And you get to the next year and, and you sell $2 million and you're twice as broke, right? Mm. Because of the inventory situation, you know, the, and the, you need a bigger warehouse and you need more staff and you need, you know, there's all these expenses yeah. come along with growth. And we pretty much doubled our way for, for you know, many of those years. We were doubling every year. And that's a tremendous burden to – you cannot sustain that from internal you know, profits. You have to get outside capital. And when I started, it was you know, a friend's you know, investment of 20 grand. And then we, as we grew, we ne- needed 100,000. And, well, they don't have it. Mm-hmm. Right, so I find a new group who does have a hundred grand, but they don't want the old ones in. Mm-hmm. So I had to do my own personal deal to buy them out, and then here we go with the next one. And, and it, then that, like I was a meat in the sandwich three or four times um, in in growth, and I finally got to these 
guys in in Anaheim that that, that had the the ability to buy you know container loads of boots, and uh, that was when I finally got some sort of normalcy because they they were going to take on all of the uh, physical you know buying distribution, um, managing all of the office work, and I was just going to be a full-time salesman on the road mm. and by now i loved sales I, I i started off terrified but i now i love sales were you good at it at this point it, oh, it, was, it wasn't even work it was so easy for me yeah. to sell they used to joke I, I i would get these you know people come into a trade show booth and i i would find out about what how big their store was and i'd sell them you know 50 pairs and then i'd back them off no i think let's start with 20 and no let's go with 100 you know and mm. i could make them buy anything i was i was you know that good at it yeah but i i never sold any boots to anybody that i didn't think they could get rid of within the season because the last thing you want any retailer to do is look at sheepskin boots on the shelves in the summertime i mean it's <laughs> just anathema so i was really clever at loading up the stores with how much i thought they could sell i'm curious also you know what was the biggest motivation for you at this time you talk about you know this feeling of people telling you, oh, this is a great product, Brian, we're going to be rich. Like, was, mo was money the biggest motivator or was it something else? Was it th this desire to feel like you've built something that's impactful or like, do you remember early on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my, the overall theme for, for the 20 years that I had the business was that one in two Australians owned some sort of sheepskin footwear, right? And it mm -hmm. always came back to that, no matter how desperate things became was one in two people in Australia. So it's not the product, it's me, right? But I want to take that one step deeper because okay. this is like this, you know, you're, you're, you're observing this um, pattern in Australia that people have this and maybe Americans should have it too. But what between, I guess, money being the motivator, this desire to create an impactful business or just making Americans experience a new product and just seeing that, like what... What was the underlying thing that got you up in the mornings and got you through these tough times that you can think back? Because I, I think you know, money being a motivator is super fair, especially if you're not coming oh, yeah. from a lot of money. Yeah. It really gets you going. But like, I'm just curious what it was for you. Well, I always knew that if I could you know, find the answer to getting these out there, that I would become rich. That, that, was, yeah. that was a given. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew how big the american market was right but how to do it that was the problem mm -hmm. and uh again when you when we talked about the the um need for inventory that was always uh the limiting factor on my growth mm -hmm. because after a while i you know we uh, this group in anaheim we we did a deal finally where they were going to handle all of the logistics and i was just going to be the on-the-road salesman right. and i had like 30 or 40 sales reps across the country uh by now we, we were doing four or five million dollars in sales at this time so it was starting to become like a business uh and so we moved all the inventory up to anaheim and uh and we had a really cool deal. Uh, it was the best deal I could make. It, it was, we were all going to, there were three of them and me. And so we were going to own the company 25% each. They were going to handle all of the office and, and warehouse and distribution issues. And I was going to be full time on the road. And uh, the thing, though, that, that I didn't actually get my stock certificate issued until we finished a trademark lawsuit that I was in with a company called UGHS, mm -hmm. right? And I knew I was going to beat them. And so everything was great. We moved everything up to Anaheim to their warehouse. Uh, that, you know, spent all weekend getting it ready. And then, you know, the next week I drive down Beach Boulevard to my first retailer, you know, in this new arrangement. And uh, it was hunting and surfing sport. And I walked in and, and I said, hey, Derek, how you doing? He goes, hey, Brian. I heard you sold the business. I said, what? He said, yeah, I called an order in this morning and they said, you don't own it anymore. And I went, you're kidding me. They said that. And I couldn't wait to get out of there and I went to the Shell gas station next door. You know, this is before cell phones. <laughs> yeah. And I called up Anaheim. I go, Neil, what the hell are you telling people? He says, what do you mean? So you're telling me I don't own the company. He says, well, you don't. I said, yes, I do. You're my three new partners. 
And he goes, well, you don't get your share certificate. Is you? Uh, and I, I just dropped the phone, hung up, and I, I drove back to San Diego, and I pulled out the contract, you know, and I because I was living there now, and uh, I uh, went, oh shit, I don't own the company technically, you know. I went into this huge depression, mm. and for three days I didn't talk to anybody except my wife, and I didn't make a call. I couldn't receive a call. It was on this, I think it was the third night, you know, I was lying on the living room floor on my back watching TV and my wife was on the couch and, and the show finished so I clicked off the TV and I rolled over on my stomach and I got up on my hands and knees and started crawling to the bedroom and my wife, who's really quiet, she just looked at me and goes, you get up now and walk to bed like a man, you know. She scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and uh, But as I was getting up, it was like coming out of a fog, you know, and I thought, oh, my God, there's so much more to life than this crappy little sheepskin company. And uh, I slept like a baby that night. Mm. And uh, the next day I started meditating again, and I, it was, uh, you know, what am I going to do with my life, you know, accountant, no. Uh, you know, real estate. So no. at this point, you felt like you were just not going to be a part of the company anymore. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah. I was out. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and then um, I was running through business broker, maybe you know, and then I got these goosebumps again, and I just thought sales. You know, I've come to love sales. Okay, so what can I sell? And that's when the goosebumps sort of really hit, and I said, "Well, oh, shit, Ugg boots," you know, so. <laughs> I love selling Ugg boots. So I called the guys up at Anaheim and I said, look, I may, I may never own the company, but I'm going to try and get a pair of Ugg boots on every single person in America. And, and we made a deal, don't ever tell anybody I sold the company, right? Because I had hundreds of retailers by now, you know. And that, but you still own 25%, no? I, I was destined to own 25% right. as soon as I finished the trademark suit, right. yeah. But so... Um, we went back out on the road, you know, that, and, uh, got back after the first month and Neil handed me a check for $5,000 and said, Hey, that's your commissions. And literally that was the first money I'd ever pulled out of the company. And that was nearly five years. And, uh, went back on the road for the next month and got back a check for 10 grand. The next month, another check for 10 grand. And I was just feeling like the luckiest guy in the world. Cause I was out there s selling was was playing golf or surfing or hanging out with the surf shop retail yeah. it wasn't wasn't work what year was this around this was in the mid to late 80s now okay yeah 86 87 88 had you been back to australia at all during that five Se years several times to visit with the manufacturer yeah, yeah. And, and what did your parents say or did you I, mean, I assume you visited them, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what, what were they but thinking? They were starting to come around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, yeah. My dad was always, oh, you're going to have these problems, and you know, and I'd talk about right. the financing, and oh, right. you're going to have these problems, and he was always putting me on on the, on alert about yeah. people who are going to rip me off and all that. Like he was so negative, um, but uh, you know, he, he was supportive. When, when he, you never asked them for money to help support the no, business? No, 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 it's just a, just a thing, you know. Um, but um, anyway, we, that business, that was when I really started to begin the business and the business really started to take off Yeah, because we had plenty of inventory. They were buying by the container load, you know, and the manufacturer, George, was happy because he was getting lots of consistent money coming down. Product was flowing. and, and and uh, that that next three years was the best three years of my life. In, Do you think in, if you hadn't Hug. done the deal with the Anaheim folks, that it, it would have taken off? I I I was desperate to to get those guys in. Yeah, I, you I, needed I, it. I, yeah. Like the the banks was oh, it's a fad. It's never going to happen. I couldn't get a bank loan. Um, the investment bankers they saw a three month cycle and they were they were out. And we were way beyond friends and family. And this was only hundred thousand dollars that they were giving you. Um, no, by the time the Anaheim guys came in, a container load was about a quarter of a million dollars. But still, in today's terms, I mean, you could get most people to write you a quarter million dollar check. 
without well, thinking too much. I've tried to start a lot of things, and it's not that easy. <laughs> but I mean, you had four years of product here. You had four yeah. years of sales. I mean, it wasn't like a seed it, stage company. It look it, look, Americans just didn't think. You know, yeah. I, I remember I, it, it, in those formative years, I was coaching San Diego State's rugby team, you know, yeah. as a volunteer thing. And I, these guys would all come over to my house and they'd see all the boots everywhere. They'd go, ah, oh, these are never going to work, you know. Yeah. I mean, that was just the general. Right. I mean, years and years and years into the business, you know, people would just tell me how horribly ugly they were. It was right. never going to work. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. to be completely frank, I mean, I thought the same thing too when I yeah, first I'm, saw them. Yeah. And, you know, because girls were wearing it in high school, right, or like even yeah. before, like eighth grade, ninth, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade. Yeah. And you were just like, these aren't what, what I don't know what these are. Right. Right. Like, you know, when, when you're, and I think it's a testament that a lot of people are going to knock something that they don't know about yet. That's right. You know, cause you're bringing it. It's not even an iteration of a shoe that we already existed. It was, it was a new product here, a new thing that yeah. really people had not seen, maybe unless they had been to Australia or lived there at some that, point. That's exactly right. So the first reaction is usually let's knock it. Yep. And then maybe let's try it. And then, oh, shit, this is actually kind of comfortable. Yeah. And yeah, maybe it's not the most aesthetic shoe, even though now I think it's become that that is what well, it, it is. It's taken on its own, yeah. its own image right. now. But at the time, you, they were pretty damn ugly, you know? And, yeah, and yeah. Uh, they just didn't fit the norm of it. It was shirt. more of a functional shoe rather yeah. than an aesthetic. Yeah. But interestingly enough, um, you know, that they did a, a survey of, of Footwear News, which mm -hmm. is a big New York. Um, fashion magazine, uh, they did a, a uh, expose on the 100 most important shoes in the last, you know, ever. Uh, and uh, Ugg was right up there. And, you know, yeah. So it, yeah. It, 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 it did become its own thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So in the mid, yeah, mid to late 80s, this happens. What comes, what comes next, you know, throughout the next decade? And how long are you involved? And, and you know, sure. The, I, I was going to tell you one more breakthrough. And, and by the way, the, in in my book, um, which is you know the story of the beginning right through to the sale, yeah, um, that story I just told you about, um, you know, being on the road and making a lot of money as in commissions. That was, you know, I have lots of little bits of philosophy that I throw in the right. book, and and the one that suits that story is that nearly always your most disappointing disappointments will become your greatest blessings, mm -hmm. and I talk from the stage and I, you know, I tell those stories and, and I say people, you know, raise your hands if in the last six months something disastrous happened in your business or your personal life and you look back now and think, thank God that happened. Right. Yeah. And 80 to 90% of the people put their hands up. And, and do you think that that disastrous moment serves as that quote-unquote aha moment for you to actually get up and do something about it? It's the biggest breakthrough. Every time you have those those moments and you do find a solution, that's called growth. Right. Right? It's 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 a disaster looking forward, but it's right. a blessing looking backwards, right. you know? And, and what does it take, I mean, as maybe kind of speaking more philosophically I'm getting, I'm getting goosebumps talking about that. Yeah. That, yeah. that. That's that's how important that message is. Yeah. And, and what does it take, right? Like, you know, I think a lot of people have had those moments. They, people probably listening to this story right now are thinking, shit, I probably had a disastrous moment last week. Right. Right. Or tomorrow or, you know, the day before yesterday, you know, but what does it take to say, okay, this happened. Okay. We accept that. That's the reality. Right. What the fuck am I going to do? Yep. What's next? Yep. How do you, how do you, how do you get up and do it and actually yeah, grow? well. Well, I, uh, you know, I tell people from, again from the stage, you know, I, when it happens to me now, I just go, ah, shit, that's good. Mm. Now, what's good about it? Yeah. And that's the quickest way for me to find a solution. But, but I've been doing this for years and years. Right. But the, I, I wrote down a quote from a book, um, a book of philosophy that I wrote down 20 years ago uh, and typed it out and put it in the front of my daily planner every year. So if you look today, it's, it's that same piece of paper in my daily planner. And it, it has four statements, feast upon uncertainty, mm -hmm. fatten upon disappointment, invigorate in the presence of difficulties, and enthuse over apparent defeat. And those, those have been on my – when I first discovered them, they are on my refrigerator, mm -hmm. right? 
and I could didn't matter what happened in the business or per, especially personal life, you know, because shit happens there too. Yeah. Um, w- w- if you can sort of take whatever happened and match it up against those four statements, you know, the feast, fatten, invigorate, you know, they're all positive, motivating sort of things you can do, and it doesn't matter what word you put on the end. Right. Because that's the disaster, right? Right. But if you can take that mindset into what happens, it's incredible how fast you'll find a, a solution and you look back and go, wow, that was great, you know? And that's that's growth. You know, people talk about, you know, disasters, you know, ad- adversarial things happening and, and you know, they, they want to give up. Well, d- defeat's not real until the second you say, I'm done. Right. Defeat's... It just doesn't exist until you say I'm done. Then you right. de- then you're defeated. So uh, there's always a way around, or through, or under, or over an obstacle. Yeah, what I what I take from that is like these obstacles are inevitable. Like they're gonna happen. If if, you know, if you're if doing you anything worth, yeah. Doing. Imagine the poor poor bastard who grows up with no nothing going wrong. Right. I mean, how empty would that person be? Right. You know? I, I don't think that exists. Who who we are is is a result of how we've coped with everything that's come up in our lives, and that's the beauty of the whole creation. And that's 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 the beauty of these spirit fragments being in us. They don't give up. Mm. They're they're what keep you going on, right? And so it's just like a testing ground down on this planet. Mm-hmm. I think you mentioned it in your book because I wrote it down um, and it's a quote that I love and I, I think it's a quote that a lot of people know but it's Paolo Coelho's uh, quote in The Alchemist where he talks about you know the uh, when you, you really want, want something, something the whole uni- you know oh, the universe, universe will conspire to work with you yeah yeah and yeah. This, it's like this you know yep. concept of like manifestation and yep. like kind of envisioning something and putting it out there yep. but can you shed some more light on that I, and how, okay yeah. I'll give you a great example When's the last time you saw an advertisement for a refrigerator? It's been a while for me. Long time. But you can't remember, right? No. No. But if you needed a refrigerator. Well, I'm about to get this advertisement next because week, you're talking about it right now. If you needed one next week, you would start seeing refrigerators everywhere. You would see 100%. them in you'd see them in the ads on TV. You see yeah, because you're it, seeking it out. It be, it, because your awareness has has zoned in on something, right, on refrigerators. And you could be in, in you know, Starbucks and the, the classified ads would be open and there's a page full of refrigerators. You, you, but until you start out on the path, let me backtrack. The universe is absolutely full and complete, Everything you could possibly want already exists on this planet. You can think of anything that doesn't already exist. But until you set your focus on that refrigerator, you don't see the evidence of it, right? Yeah. But now when you focus on, on the refrigerator, you, you'll, you'll find shit everywhere about refrigerators and you'll eventually get one. Yeah. And that's the same in starting a business. That's the same in doing something for your kid. That's the same. You, once you focus in on it, you start to see all the evidence that's always been there, but now it supports you, whereas before you didn't even see it. It's right. almost like a filter that you're putting. Ex- exactly. Um, because you're, we're all, all inundated by these yeah. things on a daily basis, messaging yeah. from magazines and television yeah. and friends and word yeah. of mouth. It could be anything, but like yeah. you're sort of filtering it and, and selectively. Yeah, it's, it's probably one of the most infallible laws that once you decide to settle on a path, all the whole universe will conspire to work with you. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you talk about um, some of these competitors that came out, similar names or not names, but like similar products perhaps. Right. Uh, do you think, what, what do you think it was about UGG that really set it apart from the others? Was it, I mean, obviously the product, but was it like the brand and, and really um, what that meant? The, the brand was, we, we were jealous of protecting that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyone who used the word UGG, uh, we... Uh, had an issue with um, but eventually they they all you know we, we'd see each other at the trade shows all the time all the competitors and I believe me I helped a bunch of them get sales because there were certain you know I wanted to be in all the top major re- retail right. stores but there are a whole other level of stores underneath them that I couldn't sell to because it would piss off the big ones but they really wanted Ugg boots so I would send all my friends you know I'd, I'd talk them up to my competitors, mm. right? Mm. So it was a pretty small uh, community of UGG suppliers. 
when you really look at it. Um, but the reason we stayed so dominant is that, you know, you can't patent a shoe, you can't patent the color, you can't patent the style. So we had a mantra of, of let's get out front first and then run faster. Pretty simple, just let's run faster. And so I'd be at a trade show and I'd see all these Koreans and Chinese people coming to buy and they're photographing all my product, you know. <laughs> and I knew that, oh God, next year they're gonna they're gonna have all that next same day. They're, they're gonna have it all on their, their birth, right? And so but before the next show, you know, because it's very seasonal, yeah. uh, the the sheepskin boot business, um, I'd spend all summer getting new styles and new colors of skins and things. And so the next trade show, they'd all show up and they've got all of my last year's products, perfect, you know, out on their booths. And I've got a completely new line of colors and styles. So they're all just behind. Yeah. So we just stayed out front and ran faster. And, and that's, yeah. that's been the best philosophy for, you know, there are certain products that you just can't. And did you start working well with these other three partners? I mean, did it become like a true team or was it just kind of always you did your thing, they did theirs? That's a really good oh – God, these are some stories, right? Um, over the next three years, Neil bought Paul and Joe out. Yeah, so right? he's now 75% on So it. Neil's 75 – well, Neil, yeah, 75 and there's my 25 hanging, right? In the meantime, I've been all over the country now working with my reps. And so Neil saw what a great job I was doing out on the road. I right. was also doing all the marketing. I was doing the advertising and all of that. And he knew he couldn't do that. Right. And so in the meantime, he brought Paul and Joe out. So he finally said, you know, and I'd finished the trademark lawsuit mm -hmm. right in that third year. And so Neil called me up and said, hey, come on in. You know, we're, we're uh, going to issue you 25% of the stock and uh, – and by the way, let's get life insurance policies, which we we did. We had the broker come in, and and we got new company cars. And uh, I was uh, getting ready to go. He said, "You know, coming next Wednesday." Well, my wife called me on Sunday. You know, now I had a cell phone. It was in yep. the in the car. You know, and uh, she was crying, and she goes, "Oh, Brian, that Neil's just died," and he had been at a motocross race. Mm and had a massive heart attack. And uh, my initial reaction was, oh, it was purely selfish. It was, oh, shit. Mm. I was so close to owning this, you know, my piece. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, his widow owns it 100%. And, and I know that she's never set foot inside the warehouse or the office. She, she had no idea what was going on. And so my world just crashed, you know. I, I'd seen myself as a CEO of this huge footwear company one day and now nothing. <laughs> but I called up his widow, Della, and said, hey, I'll be up tomorrow uh, to Anaheim and we'll figure out what we're going to do. And basically I, I signed on for a year uh, with no salary, just working on all my excess commissions. And, uh, and I tried to figure out, you know, how to make it work. And I, I realized that the company wasn't that solvent. Because again, we'd been doubling. We were doubling again this next year, and I th that became the longest year of my life. I, I started off driving up to Anaheim from San Diego, uh, two and a half hours, two and a half hours back every that, day. That every day for that lasted two weeks, and then I got the train up every Monday morning, and back Friday nights. And every Friday night, I'd be coming home with a most chronic sore throat yeah. and being run down. I and I knew all the, you know, the first names of the waitresses and at Bob's Big Boy, you know, <laughs> in the midnight to, four, you know, the 5 a.m. shift, yeah, you yeah. know. And, uh, oh, it was so hard. And, but the bottom line is I, I realized that, that we didn't have the money to, you know, buy new product. I knew, I knew I had to get new investors. And George at Country Leather had just had four or five years of really good income from the production. And now he was, you know, up in the air. Was you know, I called it, you know, called him up and said, "Hey, you know, Neil's died." And he said, "Whoa, shit! How are you going to pay me?" Uh, you know, and it was like, "Don't worry, George. I'll I'll get investors." And you know, what's the saying that George always says? She'll be right, mate. <laughs> She'll yeah. be right, mate. 
<laughs> yeah, that's an Australianism, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so I spent the first four or five months, you know, this, this happened in, in January. Mm. And uh, so, but, but you're basically running the company. Like, yeah, luckily we just got all the new colors and styles out yep. to, to all the reps. And, and I brought on two new colors, gray and, you know, charcoal and, and uh, black. And the reps were just kicking butt with it out in the field. And uh, I, I was trying to, you know, get money from the banks. Oh, it's a fad. No, it's not a fad. It's eight, you know, nine years now. Right. Yeah, but fashion, you know, can turn on you. You won't be around next year, you know, over and over and over, every bank I went to. And uh, the uh, weird thing is that all these incredible increase in orders are coming in from all the sales reps. And I'm bundling them together and sending them down to George, going, "Hey, George, you know, it's it's uh, going to be a fantastic season. Have you, you know, have you got started yet? Well, you know, how are you going to pay me? You know, and you know, a month later, I'd send another ten or fifteen thousand pair order down. And George, how are you, how are you doing with production? Well, you know, I can't seem to find the grey and the black skins. You know, you know, I'm thinking bullshit. You know, and he just kept stalling and stalling and. And, uh, you know, as, as much as I could, you know, stay awake, I was just racking my brains how to finance the production. And it was getting, you know, April, May, June, and now it's looking like we're going to double our last year's sales. June by June, I, I realized, shit, we're not going to be able to, you know, I don't, I don't know how, how to finance it. So I started thinking laterally again, and I thought, well, who would benefit from me being in, in business? And it finally came to me that the tanneries, you know, the, their business is selling sheepskins. Mm -hmm. So I should go down and, you know, canvas all the, sh the, 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 you know, the tanneries. And I, did, I sent business plans to three or four of them, and one of them came back and said, oh, Brian, this is the best thing in the world. Come on down. And uh, I did, and I met this guy, little guy, Gordon Jackson, and uh, – he showed me all around the tannery and showed me how it all works. And we went back to his office and, and on his desk is this plaque, you know, it says, I, I reserve the right to change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I was sort of, sort of on, um, ominous, you know, as I walked in. But anyway, we, we got started on how many skins we're going to need and what colors and, well, you know, and, and finished up the day. And, and then the next morning I – I get a call from him at the hotel, and he says, "Oh, Brian, you know, I, I don't think we're going to be able to do this deal. I've, you know, I've figured out how much money it takes, and and you're in LA, and we're in, you know, Melbourne, and and God, no, it's just too too risky." And so sounds I, like he changes his mind often. Yeah, so I stayed in the hotel all that day, <laughs> and then then the next next day he calls up and says, "Brian, don't worry, I've got a solution. You know, I've got a." really good friend in the meat board and he's he lives in LA and he's going to look in on you and and so I got back into it with him and we figured out the sizes and all the you know logistics of that and the next morning it was oh Brian you know you know it's a family owned company and and I don't control it and and you know we had a big talk last night and I got outvoted and so we're not going to be able to do it you know and the bottom line is I left back for LA um with no deal and the first person I spoke to when I got back was my sales rep uh, in, in the office and, and you know, the local girl. And she, she goes, Brian, there's, there's a company out here selling uh, you know, sheepskin boots and they, they claim they're going to be putting Ugg out of business. And I go, oh, my God, who are they? You know, and, she, and she says, a company called Thunderwear. And so I pulled up the trade directory and i look them up and i go god damn it they're a windsurfing company what the hell are they doing in sheepskin boots and and then they you know they sell wetsuits and booties and you know gloves and stuff and i just threw it away i said i got bigger problems than a competitor you know <laughs> i don't even have a manufacturer yeah and so i kept you know trying to raise money but now it's like july and and the first trade show that kicks off you know the fall shipping is in in august you know and uh i uh still had no manufacturer and the the trade show uh called action sports retailer show was was in long beach in, in the first of august and and i talked with my wife and said look i don't have a clue 
you know, where we're going to pull, how we're going to pull this off, but I'm not ready to give up yet. So we decided to go ahead, put all our product out in the show and build the booth. And we used all last year's products. And uh, when we finished setting all that up, I thought, I wonder where those Thunderwear people are. And I looked in the trade directory and they were way back in the corner, you know, and I walked over and I stopped a couple of booths short and I just went, oh, shit. Because there was all my grey boots, all the mm. charcoal, all the natural, the sand colours, and they the label they had on the back of the boots was thugs, you know, well, thugs, thugs like thunderwear, but Uggs, oh you know? Jesus! And and I just thought that name was rather appropriate, you know? yeah. <laughs> and that's that's when I knew I was out of business, mm. right? I, I I I had an inkling that George was. You know, finding somewhere else to ship the boots, and so it was George doing that. It was George. They they bought all of my product from George with the Thugs labels on. <laughs> yeah, what a horrible name. Ah, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, I called up my wife and I said, "Look, I'm just I'm just going to you know ride the show out." I didn't tell any of the customers. I didn't tell any of my salespeople. Um, and we spent the next three days. We 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 wrote a record quarter of a million dollars of sales in three days, and. And I knew we, we couldn't ship any of it, but um, we packed up the booth on the Sunday night, went back to San Diego, and the last call we made that night, I made that night was to Gordon at the tannery, and I just said, hey, Gordon, you know, I, I really want to thank you for all the help. You know, we, we really tried to get this together, but George has done an end run. You know, he's found a new distributor, and, uh, you know, Laura and I are just going to, sort of shut it down and see what to do next year. And uh, he was sad. And we went to bed and, and then about 2 o'clock in the morning the phone rang and I picked it up and hello. And he goes, Brian, it's Gordon. Screw George Bircher. I'll get you all the boots you need. And, and just like that we were back in business, you know. No, no handshake, no contract. No, and so I, the next morning I sent down all the patterns for all the different styles and sizes and he cranked his tannery up to full production and he had five different suppliers, uh, five different manufacturers all working on the product. And, and, and I must say this, the quality that year was pretty poor, <laughs> but it didn't matter because we got… It was worse than George's? Oh, yeah, much worse, yeah. Because yeah. we'd had you know, six or seven years refining right. yep. our product. But this was first year, you know, straight out of the gates. But anyway, the, the, it didn't matter because you know, that, that two weeks later we got 2,000 pairs in on, on the Friday and the next Friday 5,000 pairs and the next Friday and it went all the way through Christmas with, you know, 5,000 pairs would arrive right. and I, I would put half of it aside for all the accounts back east mm -hmm. and the other half was for all the surf shops and they, were, they didn't even want to wait for UPS. They, right. they drove down every Friday morning. They figured out Friday was when the shipment came mm -hmm. in and they were there waiting and, and so – we would just, you know, every, every, every Friday for September, October, November, December, we were able to ship out. And that year we threw away one and a half to two million dollars worth of orders. We just never caught up. Brian, how, how much of an impact did running this business and, I mean, the struggle of running this business have on your uh, relationship, not only with your wife, but also just, you know, with other friends. Cause I mean, you talk about how before this business, you were a very social guy. Everybody knew you back in Australia. Right. And now you're just, you know, laser focused on this business. Yeah. I mean, had you become a different person? That one year I was just describing, yeah. I was a total different person. Yeah. I was so lonely. I mean, now you have YPO, you have EO, you right. have all these different support groups. Right. You can't get financing. Hey, go talk to Joe, you know, right, right. Uh, and all these things just flow so easily. Right. But back then, none of that existed. And right. I, I was Robinson Crusoe out there just trying to yeah. figure out how to stay alive. So that one year, I literally didn't speak to anybody outside the office. I, I didn't play golf. I didn't surf. I, I, well, I, I surfed it when, when I could, but um, it was so desperate uh, at that time. But overall, luckily, my, my wife just had this blind faith that, that I'd pay the rent every month. And, you know, and I did somehow. You know, there were, there were months when we had to put the wages on credit cards, but, some, you know, somehow the rent kept getting paid and mm -hmm. 
you know, during those good times, we'd bought a house, so, you yeah. know, we were pretty comfortable. Um, but, yeah, th this year I didn't know if it, we were going to survive or not, but, you know, thank God. The, the two really weird things happened um, between Christmas and New Year of that, you know, that desperate year. We'd stayed alive, and I, I remember after the 24th of December, the phones go dead, you know. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to come to the, you know, nobody wants boot shift. It's, it's just too late. So all the staff took off for their Christmas break. And uh, I remember sitting in the office by myself just, you know, thinking, God, how lucky was I that Gordon came through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a shitty year. We threw away millions of orders, but we're still alive. And then the phone rang and it was um, – the life insurance company in Los Angeles. And they say, hey, look, we, we know you guys never got the physicals done, but we want to get this off our books before December 31. Can you come up to LA? So, so I drove up there with my lawyer, and the bottom line is after a whole day's negotiation, we, we got enough money um, on the policy to completely buy Neil's widow out, mm. Della. So she not only got... 100% all the assets that we had at the time. She also got the profits for the year. And uh, she was so thankful because you know, had I walked away a year earlier, she'd have, no she, money. She'd have nothing. She, she would have been yeah, probably bankrupted. Uh, so she was happy. And in return, I got to be 100% owner of UG again, you know. Wow. Um, and who would have ever seen that coming? You know, I was absolutely broke, but I owned UG 100%, mm. you know. And the the other funny thing that happened is that the customs brokers shipped four thousand pairs of of thugs to me, and two thousand pairs of Uggs up to them. Right, so I called the guy up. He was thirty forty minutes away in San Clemente, and um, I drove up and we swapped all the product out. And and as I was driving back, you know, down through Camp Pendleton, mm. it's like. When you leave LA and you you know you hit yeah. camp pedal and my, my blood rate just my pulse just goes you know slower, and I was thinking, oh my god, you know how come we couldn't keep boots in our warehouse for twenty four hours, and the thugs warehouse, which was way bigger than our warehouse, was floor to ceiling full of sheepskin boots, you know the day before Christmas, mm. yeah, I'd do a couple of days after Christmas. And that's when I realized that the loyalty of my, my customers was so powerful that they, they'd heard on the grapevine that thugs had done an end run. So they just refused to buy the O. I mean, the, who the, wants to wear the, thugs? Thugs, yeah. <laughs> like, those yeah. sound like just some crazy. I'm, I'm imagining yeah. this like Western where it's like <laughs> you and then the thugs people on the other side. It's like. <laughs> You have the product, and you're like, "Yeah, I have the product. You have the product," and you just like do a swap in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's when I realized, you know, the the those three or four years uh, that I'd been traveling with the sales reps. You know, each like Denver, the guy had the sales rep had to have ten retailers lined up right. for me, to, and I'd fly into Denver, and and so. And we did that for three years. So if you take 30 reps by 10, that's 300 right. by, you know, three years. That's 1,000 visits to these same retailers. And so I'd become friends with them. You know, right. I'd, be, I'd be in Idaho fishing with one of the, one of the, the buyers, right, mm. or playing golf in New Jersey with one of the buyers, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I had this rapport of, of all of these retailers, and, and you can't do that today because of, you know, everything's online and right. clicks and websites and, you know, thumbs ups, you know. It, but, but they were so loyal that they literally refused to buy the thug. Hmm. So you're 100% owner. What ultimately leads to the sale to Deckers in 1995, I believe? Yeah. Uh, far, okay, that, that, happened in, uh, that happened in about 1990. Oh, no, no, 80, 80, yeah, the, the late 80s, almost 1990. Uh, and then for the next five years, I was able to get an investor that, and now I was more savvy, right. understanding about finance. So we had a good investor that, that took it up to 95. And there was, in the 94 season, we did about, I think it was 13 million, I think it was in sales. Wow. 
and uh, I knew from the preseason sales in January that oh shit, this is looking like it's going to be a twenty million dollar season, and I knew that there was no way these guys were going to be able to finance it, and I had the luckiest thing happen. Um, do you remember when I was back in the parking lot at Malibu? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A couple of spots up was this guy, Doug Otto, and uh, he had a product called, they, they were flip-flops or thongs, we call them thongs in Australia, but they're neoprene, pink, yellow, pink, neoprene, yep. triple deckers, mm -hmm. and he, he had his company was called Deckers, right, because of these triple decker sandals. And he, as I was, you know, he and I were building our businesses, and we, we'd be in and out of the same surf shops all the time. We, we got to be friends. And uh, he went on the licensing route. So he started licensing all these different surf brands. And eventually he licensed the name Tiva for Tiva Sandals. Mm -hmm. And when the outdoor market took off in the early 90s, he went public uh, with that. It was in about 94, 95. And uh, he, I, I knew, did really well out of that. And I, and I knew that. He was sitting on about twenty-eight to thirty million dollars in cash from that, and here I was with a looking at a twenty million dollar season and no way to finance that. And I was uh, going to a show in Atlanta called the Super Show, a big sporting goods show, and way at the other end of the baggage claim, I saw Doug, and and I got this massive dose of goosebumps. So I went, "Oh my God, it's perfect," you know, because his Business died every winter, and our business died every summer. Mm. And so, by putting together, you have a twelve-month warehouse, right. twelve-month sales force, twelve. Yeah, you know, everything was just right. Makes hard. sense. And 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 uh, I walked up to him, and we we high fived, and I said, "Hey, Doug, you know, if, if we, we we'd always joked about buying each other out, and I said, if ever we're going to do it, now's the time." And. Uh, that afternoon, we had the accountants back in California talking to each other, and and you know by October, I think November that year, we we ended up doing the sale for cash. So it, it was like me going public without having to go public. Right. It, it was a brilliant, you know. But that, yeah, I went, when I got those goosebumps, I went, "Oh my god, this is so perfect." Um, what are are you are you surprised at all about? the success that Ugg has had since the sale? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. It it's, depends on the number you want to throw out, right? Yeah. I remember, you know, we, we, when we sold it, the, the, the Teva sales force took over the Ugg sales force, uh, you know, took over the Ugg brand. And I remember having to go up to the headquarters in Santa Barbara and I remember getting up on stage and I, and I said, hey, congratulations, you guys, you know. You've just inherited the UGG brand, and I, I see this going to 200 million in sales, right? And they had, you know, Teva up to 60 million, and this this groan went out through the audience. I could <laughs> I could feel it, you know? <laughs> like who the hell is this guy, you know? And uh, I literally thought that 200 million would be a really good end. I never saw the billion dollars. <laughs> Coming and and it was the first year it hit a billion. I was oh my god, and now it's been two billion plus for for two or three years now, and so I uh, I have a really wonderful attitude to selling mm. uh, now. Yeah, and and I got to backtrack because we and we haven't talked about my book, but the theme of the book, which is really a roadmap for entrepreneurs, and it's the story of the beginning, the, the aha, right through to the sale of Arg. And the theme of the book is that you can't give birth to adults. Right. Right? And this is so true for every business that you have the initial aha moment, that that's the conception, and you, you have, you're on fire with, with opportunity and potential, and then you give birth, and like the birth of Ugg was buying those three pairs of samples, mm -hmm. and but every business then you have birth and it just lies there, and it lies there, and it lies there, and there's no amount of feeding it or playing with it or jiggling the cradle. You, you'll get a few laughs now and again, mm. but it just lies there. And, and that's when most entrepreneurs give up because they, 
they've had their big aha, they're going to make millions of dollars, and then it doesn't seem to work. Mm -hmm. But if you can hang in through that infancy, it'll start to be the toddler, you know, which is right. cool because, you know, magazines, they're writing articles about you or your first friends, the true believers are telling everybody, you know. So it, it then goes from, from toddling, it, it eventually goes into the youth phase, which in, in my opinion is the best because you've got consistent sales and orders coming in the production's working accounting and administration's working marketing's working and you can run a 20 30 million dollar company in that youth phase uh, but if it's a great product or a great service you're going to hit the teenage years and and you know you recall when you wanted to be in every party on a saturday night oh, yeah. as a teenager it's the same in business you want to be in every major trade show and you want to be in every mass retailer and it's suicide if you grow too quickly because you outstrip your capital and eventually it just becomes a mature company. Right. So how I, back to your question, how do I feel now about seeing it in the billions? It's like I, I gave, you know, conceived the idea of importing them. I gave birth by buying those samples. I went through this horrible infancy, you know, three years of really shitty marketing and getting nowhere. And then that began the toddling phase, you know, where, you know, I had different, you know, investors come in and we grew it from you know, three to five to eight million. And then we got into the teenage years when, like, we were doing 10 million and I had all these good sales. And then uh, I look at, uh, you know, handing off the, you know, like walking my business down the aisle and handing it off to Deckers to get married and go out into the big world. Right. And that's how they got into the, you know, the, mil you know, the hundreds of millions and the billions. So um, it, it doesn't surprise me that it got that big because I always knew the product was good. It was me was always the limiting factor. Well, Brian, this has been such an enjoyable conversation. Thank you for giving birth to this brand. And that's hey, the name of the book, I think, right? Is The, the Birth, birth of, of a Brand. brand. Yes. And people can find that on Amazon yes, and yes. Uh, wherever books are found. But we appreciate you coming by and hey. sharing this incredible well, story with us. Thanks for leading me on such a great journey again, man. It was really cool. Thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah.